Tonight's invention has had a bit of a chequered history. On the upside, it's given us mass production, advanced trauma surgery, and the royal family. On the downside, it's taken away the Barbary lion and the Tasmanian tiger. Without it, World War I would have been a bit of a damp squib, and World War II might never have happened. Its effects have ricocheted around every continent on Earth. I am, of course, talking about the gun. The gun has one purpose, to kill. To kill animals and to kill people. From the streets of South Central Los Angeles through the plains of Africa to the jungles of Vietnam, its effect has been absolutely devastating. It is a hateful thing. The gun has prematurely ended the lives of countless millions. From the organized but anonymous slaughter of the First World War to high-profile assassinations, the gun has changed the course of history in a truly appalling way. And yet, if you carry one, you win every argument. You always get your own way. And that gives you an immense sense of power. And power is an aphrodisiac. This may well be an instrument of Satan but it is unbelievably sexy. While the gun has created some rather esoteric fetishes, it's also brought us street lighting, steam engines, cowboy movies, and even affordable cars. And the gun itself has become a major pinup. Film and TV have taught us that by carrying one, we are invincible which, ironically, is what gunpowder was all about in the first place. You see, gunpowder, it's said, was originally created in the 9th century as an elixir of immortality. But pretty soon, everyone realized that instead of making you live forever, it did the exact opposite. Gunpowder spread like wildfire. Eventually, it fell into the hands of the Crusaders, who brought it, along with the plague and a variety of other interesting diseases, back to Blighty. Enter monk, scholar, and explosives expert Roger Bacon. Until Bacon, the powder had to be imported, but in 1249, Father Roger worked out how to make it. As everyone now knows, you take four parts potassium nitrate and three parts of sulfur and charcoal, and there you are. Back then, though, the simplicity counted for nothing. The church, in fact, denounced it as the devil's work. However, by the middle of the 15th century, the church had decided that gunpowder was a nice little earner especially as they had sole access to one of its main ingredients. Even in the 15th century, getting hold of charcoal and sulfur was straightforward, but potassium nitrate was another matter. The only reliable source was urine. And according to the collective wisdom of the age, the ecclesiastical urine of a bishop was by far the best. And if a bishop wasn't available, you could always try a cannon. The trouble with gunpowder, though, is that if you burn it in the open air, well, this is what happens. It just goes and ruins your tablecloth. So what you've got to do is burn it in a confined space and then channel the explosion down a barrel. A bit like this. Bloody hell! Now, exactly the same principle as that is used in every gun. Pistols, rifles, machine guns, even the gun I'm going to make for you now. What you need is uh, some plumber's pipe, like this. Um, 
anything that makes a spark, a barbecue lighter is ideal. What you end up with is something like this. Here's the barrel, here's the chamber, and here is the sparky thing, okay? Now, instead of a cannonball, what I'm going to use is a potato, okay? We, uh, we can ram it into the end like so, plunge it down exactly as you would do with a cannon, and then you unscrew the back. Now, you could use gunpowder in here, but what I'm going to use is hairspray, all right? Put the uh, back back on, and that's it. Ready? Whoa! <laughs> I'm going to hold up a bank. Interestingly, early guns were about as effective as a spud in a waste pipe. In 1418, we turned up at the Battle of Agincourt with longbows. The French army was much bigger than ours, but they were relying on cannons. And as a result, they missed a lot and lost. However, just 50 years later at Castillon, the gun was set to make the return match rather less one-sided. The French had busied themselves with cannon R&D and arrived to do battle with an artillery of more than 300 super sophisticated guns. And needless to say, they won. The longbow was suddenly very last year. The cannon was the new must-have battlefield accessory. And one of the first to wake up and smell the cordite was a young monarch called Henry VIII. He started a weapons building program that would make him unassailable and eventually give Britain the biggest empire the world has ever known. Their frigates bristling with cannon, the British set off to conquer the world. The only problem was that the French, Spanish and Portuguese also had ships, cannon and similar ambitions. So, if Britain was to rule the waves, she was going to have to blast her enemies out of the water. And that meant having better, more accurate guns. Early cannon were pretty hopeless. The barrels were wonky and the cannonballs never fitted properly. Aiming was pointless and even if you did hit, the destructive power was pathetic. However, in 1774, an iron worker called John Wilkinson came up with a solution. His machine could drill a cylindrical tube, which meant snug fitting cannonballs. In turn, that meant more accuracy, more power, and ultimately, more empire. But Wilkinson's tube boring machine had another unexpected spin off. It transformed James Watts's steam engine into the powerhouse of the Industrial Revolution. Until Wilkinson, Watts's engine had leaked. His machines were powerless and therefore pointless. But after Wilkinson, Britannia ruled the waves and had the beginnings of an industrial economy too. The cannon had brought Britain out of the Dark Ages. But was of the gun? Well, at about the time of Agincourt, it didn't show much promise. Now, this was a time way before BBC Health and Safety. So people had to operate them with no gloves, no ear protection and no goggles. So let's see, shall we, what all the danger is about.
This is it, hand cannon, and the idea was you put the shot